What you see now is the person I've grown into over the last 30 years. There was definitely a time in my life where I didn't feel like I knew my purpose or had a purpose. Starting this whole social media journey actually had a lot of resistance. I felt like it was silly. I felt like it was something that was less meaningful than what my friends were doing. There's this aspect between living a life that is, is good and living a life that feels like you were living your purpose. I was in a long-term partnership. I just got so curious about like, why isn't this working or why didn't this work? Yeah. It just showed me like how much we can live with someone and still not really understand like what it is that they're looking for. I think one of the fastest ways to growth or to intimacy is through truth. Hello, beautiful beings. Welcome back to the Know Thyself podcast, where every single week we get the privilege and opportunity to sit down with an open heart, a brilliant mind to see what we can learn from the lessons they've learned in their life to help us know ourselves deeper and deeper. My guest today is a dear friend of mine. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. She is a traveling photographer, content creator, creative visionary, free diver, acro yogi enthusiast, and all through the lens of mindfulness and trying to be an eco-driven human being and, and, and walk lightly on this planet. And the way she shows up in the way that she does online, but also in person as I've gotten to know her over the years is really inspiring. She is somebody that is such a soft spirit, yet has a very strong character and soul. And the more I've gotten to know her over the years and continue to see her in her character and, and her integrity and her level of play and the way she's able to hold a balance is just, uh, it's been admirable. And I, uh, yeah, I love her so much. So Chelsea, welcome to the podcast. I am so delighted to be here with you, Andre. Yeah. This is gonna be so much fun. So good. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. We've had so many beautiful conversations in the past, you know, just hanging out as friends or in community or doing different events. Um, and today we get to put some cameras and mics in front of us and just let the magic unfold. I know. <laughs> we basically had a podcast this morning already just sitting on the couch. I so. know. It's one of the things of just like having your friends on the podcast is you just want to drop in right when you see them. But yeah. then it's like, all right, we got a podcast to do. So let's go sit down. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So I feel like when I think of Chelsea, Chelsea Yamase. Mm -hmm. Chelsea Kawhi, as most people know you as yeah. a professional life liver, the content that you create and how you go out there and live your life online is very, it's very magnetic and mm. it's very intoxicating. It's like, you're, I feel like you're, you showcase the human experience so well. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if aliens were to come down and like see how this human lives their life, they'd be like, oh, there's, you know, life is beautiful. Earth is beautiful. Our time mm -hmm. here can be really special. And um yeah, I would like actually to kind of start with your upbringing, being raised in Hawaii. How do you feel like being raised in Hawaii kind of informs your life and how you go about living the world and being in a space that doesn't necessarily like feel the most grounded being in on social media and, you know, creating content and whatnot. But I feel like you walk with that groundedness and that presence. So how do you feel like mm. that impacted you? Mm. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where it takes a few decades to really realize how much your environment and the spaces you grew up in have shaped you so, so, so much. And I'm coming to a point in my life where I think I have enough data to look back on where I go, whoa, growing up in Hawaii was super formative for me. And so I think one of the ways that it, it just shaped me into who I am was this immense, immense love of peace and silence and being in natural wild spaces. The island I grew up on has so much access to pristine nature and just places where I can go and be completely alone, um, alone with my thoughts. Yeah, just in the state of like really connect, like deep connection with nature. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, living part-time in LA, traveling a lot, being on social media, interacting with so many people, I realize what a privilege that is that a lot of people didn't get to grow up with that sense of I wake up when I'm at home and for example, I can tell what the weather's doing. Like eyes closed, haven't looked outside. I know what the wind is doing. I can get a sense of like, you know, what spots might be good that day for surfing or for diving or whatever it is. Maybe I go up to the mountains and there's this extreme sense of just connection to place um, that I feel and it gives me this deep, I don't know, this deep rootedness and 
this enjoyment of being in solitude and being in quiet places. I've actually had friends reflect to me now. They're like, you don't listen to music nearly as much as other people do, or you don't, um, you know, maybe, maybe I don't talk as much as other people do necessarily. Uh, but yeah, so I, I think for me personally, growing up in a space that has so much silence has really encouraged me to find that serenity and that silence in myself and in the places that I go in the world. Yeah, so beautiful. I feel like there's just so much noise in modern civilization. And I think, yeah, you told me that once when we were like on a longer car drive of we weren't listening to music. It's like, it's funny, most people I'm like, I drive with like, there's always music or there's, you know, there's always uh, like, you know, a lot of noise and especially living in the city, that's the experience of most people. And to be able to find like just comfort and the peace and silence, I feel like is such a superpower and yeah. it's like our normal state. But I feel like that gives you a lot of clarity to be able to live your life and listen to yourself when you can hear yourself. Yeah. Like you said, there is just an increasing and increasing amount of noise in the world around us. And having a platform on social media, all of us are integrated now in this you know, very, very, very hyper-connected world. And the most challenging part for me of being on social media with a big platform at the beginning was hearing so many voices, so many opinions, so many thoughts that weren't mine necessarily, and having to get so clear as a person who cares deeply about showing up really hard and what people think. It was really hard to differentiate what thoughts are mine, what thoughts are not mine. And that was a big inspiration for me uh, in finding a meditation practice and um, continuing to find these ways to sort of what are tools that I can use to keep finding the silence even when I'm not at home in my zone grounded in, um, you know, when I'm on a plane, when I'm in an airport, yeah. when I'm wherever it is that I am in the world, how do you find that like centered space in, in yourself? Mm, amazing. Before we move forward, what, like, as you travel so much and you're doing so many things and how are you able to maintain that groundedness? Like what, are, what is it for you that really keeps you in that centered place? Mm. The biggest one has been a meditation practice and a journaling practice. And I, I feel like I'm like an evangelist for journaling and meditating <laughs> at this point um, because I always mention it, but it is only because it has been such a transformative tool in my life. And maybe if I had stayed in Hawaii, and I never would have really needed these things because there my routine is naturally very grounded. Um, but as I moved out into the world and didn't have as much control over my environment, I did feel this immense need to keep that like rootedness and that groundedness um, and, and to kind of like tune in with myself. And it started as a bit of a life raft of like, I really feel like I need this thing to hold on to. And then as I continued to work with it and journal and meditate, they became tools that I saw as helping further um, my evolution, even in like a positive sense. So I know most of the people I've talked to, we all come to journaling and we start using these, you know, mindfulness tools as like that lifeboat, we're going through a breakup, we're going through a job shift, we've moved, we're super ungrounded. And then as you go through it, there's this beautiful tipping point, I think that happens where it becomes almost a devotion to something that I know helps me be a greater, clearer, more honest version of myself, yeah. even in the good times. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when it really clicked in for me. Of like, mm -hmm. this is a practice I need to be doing for life where it doesn't matter where I am in the world. Yeah, it's amazing. And I feel like it's allowed you, and I know for me, it has for me to like keep you in your authentic expression of like really what you want and what you want to be creating. Because especially when you start to see some success online in your career, a lot of opportunities and doors become open to you. And it's really important that you stay reflection of like, what do you want most? And it's been beautiful to like see you craft your own lane and just not just in, you know, so on social media, but the life that you want to live from the kind of relationships that you have to the career that you um, have built for yourself to um, where you travel and what you want to create. It's uh, it's really cool to see the intentionality and consciousness that you bring into everything that you've been doing, because in many ways you're like living your life by design. And it's been really cool to see you now get to the place where you're really like, you're living the life you want, when you want, how you want, with who you want, 
and doing things as much as you want. And like, I think that's so attractive. It's dope. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Congrats. You, <laughs> you're doing you. amazing. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank um, you. And, and I hope that you feel proud of you too, because it's really beautiful to see, to see where you're at now. Um, a lot of people, I think, are attracted to the lifestyle that you live. And of course, when you post such beautiful imagery and videos online, like it's going to be very attractive for people. But um, I don't know. I, I think I've come across many creators in the past where it's almost for the sensationalism of doing these things or getting the sick shot and like looking cool. Mm -hmm. But I see you just naturally so enthused to actually like live this life and it feels very genuine and authentic to you. And so how have you been, and you don't have to go through like your whole story with it, but like, I'm sure there's been a couple moments where it's really shaped you and allowing to turn your passions into your full life, like your career. You feel like you like make a living doing what you want to do, which is amazing. And it's something that's very attractive that a lot of people want to have in their life. So how have you been able to come to this point where you're actually doing that? Mm. That is the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> um, so I, I would start by saying, yes, like what a privilege to be able to architect my own life at this point. I actually went to architecture school at one point thinking I wanted to design buildings. And I think there's that side of me that just loves creating intentionally. I love creating spaces. I love creating intentional friendships. I love creating intentional content. Uh, so that architect in me and that embodiment of wanting to design and build has always been there. Um, and the, the reality of it is what you see now is the person I've grown into over the last 30 years. And I wish there was one particular moment I could tell people, Hey, this is the thing you need to do, or this is the thing you need to seek or whatever it is. But there's, I, I haven't found that there's like this shortcut to living your most intentional life other than doing it, like being in integrity, spending time, creating that awareness around what it is that you actually desire in life and continually having devotion towards that. So I think one thing one aspect that's been a uh, key for me is how to tune into my own inner knowing and execute on that. If I go way back, so there was architecture school, there was studying graphic design, there were all these avenues that I started to take that didn't honestly make a lot of sense at the time. Um, I've had, I've stocked grocery shelves, I've been a waitress, mm. I have, you know, been a creative director, I went to journalism school. There are so many life paths that I sort of started and stopped all through my 20s mm. that didn't really make a lot of sense at the time. But those now looking back were, I was gaining tools, I was gaining knowledge, I was mining, I was figuring out my yeses and nos. And sometimes you only figure out those yeses and nos through action and through direct action and through lived experience. Yeah. So I had to live through so many different experiences, um, to go, Hey, you know what? My conditioning and my younger self thinks that I need to go and achieve and be show up in the world in a certain way. Like I thought I had to go into maybe business or architecture or just more of a prestigious academic environment because that was who I was for the majority of my life. Yeah. And, starting this whole social media journey actually had a lot of resistance and a lot of like inner self-judgment because I felt like I was, I felt like it was silly. I felt like it was something that was less meaningful than what my friends were doing. It was less noble. It was less prestigious. And it took a lot of, I guess, a trust and just leaning into the curiosity of what this could be yeah. that at the time was a bit scary and didn't really make sense. And especially if you figure six, seven years ago, it was not a known career as much as it is now to be a content creator. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was leaving a job that was quite lovely. I, I, I was making great money. I was enjoying my coworkers. Everything about it was great. Mm -hmm. or, or it just was not, yeah, there, there's this there's this aspect between living a life that is is good 
and even in some ways great and very comfortable and living a life that feels like you were living your purpose. Mm -hmm. And that is what this career has done for me is it's forced me into some really uncomfortable places and it's forced me to be the most radically honest, vulnerable, um, like it's just forced me to show up the hardest that I can in life, yeah. which is very surprising to me. I never anticipated this. And so I, I would say it's just been a journey of leaning into my curiosity and intuition of like, what is the next, just what is the next one right thing that feels interesting to me? Right. And I don't have to do it forever. I thought I was going to be doing social media for, I was like, yeah, six months, a year. I told my old boss, I was like, I, I'll probably come back, you know? Mm. And that was seven years ago. And I could not be more grateful that I at least opened that door and said, hey, what could this be? Yeah. And am I okay with sitting in that discomfort of, of thinking that maybe this isn't what other people respect or what other people think I should be doing? Um, because it, there's something there. There's a sparkle for me there. There's an enthusiasm for me there yeah. that feels interesting. Yeah. And that was the first thing of designing a life that I really wanted to live. Yeah. I love that. I think it's so important to, in the discovery of finding the life that you do want to live, you a lot of times have to experience the life that you don't want to live. Totally. And if you look at what most people actually regret in life, it's not what they've done. It's what they didn't do. It's what they had this like inner whisper, but they didn't listen to it. And then 10, 20 years go by and they have the question of what if, and that could be so painful for so many. And so I think it's really beautiful that you were at the place where you could jump into the unknown and say, I don't know if this is going to be successful. I don't know if this is going to be something I even like, but I have this inner itch, this mm -hmm. inner curiosity and calling. And I think, we could all learn from that story of listening to what are our passions? What are the things that we would do if time and money were no issue? Is it taking photos? Is it free diving? Is it acro yoga? These are all things that you love doing, but it could be, I don't know why I always say like basket weaving. It's just like the most random thing ever, but like literally whatever it is that brings you joy, can you find um, yourself in, in devoting yourself to those creative endeavors and passions? And if you get great, at anything, you can turn it into a lifestyle and a career. I, I truly believe that you can monetize literally anything, anything. turn business into from anything. And so that's beautiful. Was there a moment in particular where you've had the itch of per se photography or um, one of the things that you're doing now that you like doing, it was a passion, it was a curiosity, and now you're doing it at a, at a much bigger scale. Um, yeah, what was like, were, what were a couple of those things? And was there a particular time in your life where you really feel like you did not have your purpose. Like you were in a much darker place where mm -hmm. you couldn't see uh, the life that you wanted to live for yourself. Yeah. Well, to touch on something you said that I so resonate with, uh, one of the core tenets and beliefs in my life has been that joy creates mastery mm. and that the easiest, in, in my opinion, best way to embody and be the best version of yourself is through joy and through play. And I have found that like, yeah, photography was an initial passion of mine. And then acro yoga is more, the more recent one. And it was just a form of play. And I know from the outside, a few friends have said, Hey, like, wow, so cool that you like all of your hobbies have turned into things that you can photograph or whatever. And I was like, yeah, but like, I didn't do it for that reason. I didn't go into acro yoga thinking this is going to be great for my social media <laughs> business. Right. It was just purely a form of play that I really enjoyed. And through that joy, I became masterful in many different facets of my life. And then it became something that benefited my, you know, career and work opportunities. So yeah, it, that's, that's, I just wanted to mm -hmm. touch on that because yeah, I yeah. love, I love that concept of joy creating mastery. Love that. Um, there was definitely a time in my life where I didn't feel like I knew my purpose or had a purpose. And I, that was like my entire twenties, honestly. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, wow. I think that's really important for people to hear. Yeah, I think from the outside, it's really easy to see someone who is successful 
and to assume that because they are successful, they are living their purpose. And I think that's true for some people, but it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily true for me. And there was almost this disconnect between, um, the outward perception of, of myself and how I perceived myself. I perceive myself as successful now because there is this internal integrity with my decision-making and with how I show up in the world that is very clear to me. And that feels like purpose. Mm. And it's not so much how much money I'm making or all these other external metrics, because the funny thing about success I've found is that on the outside, there was a time in my life where I had, I was making more money than I ever thought I would. I was traveling the world. I was living this very, very beautiful lifestyle. I had the, I had the boyfriend, I had the car, I had the, all the things. And there wasn't this innate sense of satisfaction or like deep, yeah, deep purpose. I, I felt like it was an amazing life, but to reach that pinnacle and realize, wow, this, this is amazing, but it also isn't it. This isn't like the thing that is going to fulfill my soul at this deep level. Mm-hmm. Um, and the sad part is I, I think most, most of us don't even have the opportunity to get there. Um, and to experience like, oh, it's actually not about the money. It's not about the, the, the boy or the, the thing or the fancy trip that I go on. Um, so I, I feel very like privileged that I have had that experience and I could understand that those things are, those peak experiences are, are just that they're peak experiences and that what is fulfilling is being able to find joy in in like the most granular, mundane, funny, silly moments in, in life. I have felt successful when I am so enthusiastic about some, like the sunset and Mm -hmm. things that I've done and seen before and just being able to live in my joy in the moment to moment. Yeah. uh, That's when I have felt super successful. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think it's such a, it's such a switch for most people where, people view success as status, really. It's like you had a successful career, you're making lots of money. And I love the, you know, rewiring what you think about success is like, how are you feeling internally? Like really, what is your internal state? How do you feel about yourself when you're with yourself and the direction you're going? And that's what success really is. And I think it's important for all of us to just to, to decide and define what success means to us and not just what somebody else's idea of our parents or society or our college deems as success. Cause yeah, it's, it's a really important switch to have. I love the quote Earl Nightingale has about success. He says, success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Mm. And so it's like, what is this worthy ideal you've deemed in your life that you want to go after? And the progressive realization of it it's that success is it's being on the journey. It's not in the actual moment of, of attaining it because that's just one moment. Yeah. And then there's going to be another moment after that. Yeah. And there's going to be another proverbial carrot at the end of the stick that you're chasing. And it's so, that event horizon that keeps getting pushed out and pushed out. Yeah. And the end of the horizon that keeps getting pushed out is death. It's like, <laughs> if you want to get to the end of your life, okay, then you have no more life. It's like coming back into this moment finding what are those things that do make you enthusiastic about the life you're living. And, um, and then no matter where you're at, whether you have six children and working three jobs and feel like you have no time, I think that no matter where we're at in life, we can always carve five minutes, 10 minutes, do what fills us up. You know, like if you love photography, but you're currently like, that's not how you're making your living. I love how you, you've kind of planted these seeds of things that you loved and you've over time, you've protected them and you've, you know, put them on fertile soil and you've given them the right water and sunlight. And now it's bloomed to a really beautiful place to where it's like, it's the environment in which you live. It's the forest in which you embody. And it's amazing. Um, and I think that's just a really powerful take home for the listeners of like, what are those seeds that, um, that you can really find joy doing in your life that, that really light you up and start to water those and don't think it needs to happen overnight. Cause like you said, most of your twenties, You were not in a place where you were feeling purpose-driven and like you had it figured out, you know, and it's always a journey, but 
it took time and it, it does take time for that to blossom. Yeah. And my, my own journey before I was super successful on social, it was like these 1%, 5% increases in, I, I was working a full-time job and I loved camping and I loved hiking. And so I would go camping, you know, th- at night before, or after I got off work, wake up at sunrise, drive down the mountain, get to work the next day. And that was the time that I could carve out for myself and, you know, take photos in that time. And so, like you said, there's these, these planting of these seeds and this intention around protecting what it is that you love. And maybe that is a 1% of your day at the start and maybe it's 5% and then maybe it's 10 for 10%. Mm. And as you continue to architect your life and build and build and build, A, it takes time and intention and a certain devotion and res- like resoluteness. Um, mm-hmm. And to me, those those are the people that stand out to me. And the thing that stood out for myself is having the, the grit and determination to continue building those blocks, even when it is by 1% at a time. Yeah. And to have the willingness to completely innovate your life if there's a new seed that you want to plant and foster, you know, it's like oftentimes, especially when you find success in a specific modality or way of expressing yourself, especially online, people start to expect that of you. Mm -hmm. But we're constantly evolving, changing beings. And so do our desires. And whether it's one day you want to pick up acro yoga and like you just follow that itch. And then um, I love the fluidity in which you've been able to carry um what you want to create in in your life. Cause I think it's really inspiring. What do you feel like now is what, what's lighting you up most now these days? Like what, what, what really drives you? This is such a good question. Um, yes. So I, I feel like my whole career has been this path of fluidity, like you've mentioned where it started with hiking, then it went to slacklining and highlining and then free diving and then acro yoga. And there's been all these different paths that I've taken, um, and taken my audience along with me. And each time I make that switch or each time I feel like I'm shedding a layer of myself and coming into something new, there is this vulnerability that accompanies that where I'm like, maybe they're not going to like this version of me, or maybe this is too much, or maybe I'm, you know, changing too quickly or I'm becoming something that's, you know, not uh, what everyone wants me to be, or they want me to free dive and stuff. But what's been so powerful is, fully stepping into like, this is where I'm going. This is my excitement. And like, if you guys want to come with me, I'm here for it. And I think that's the same for friendships too. Like I've gone through a lot of friendship evolutions in the past few years as I've grown as a human and, and finding alignment with those things where you're like, this is what's really lighting me up. And like, do you want to be on this path with me? Mm -hmm. Um, and being okay with like, letting go of some of those things or some people or situations that don't continue to be in alignment with, with what you're doing and where you're going. Um, what's lighting me up now is I'd say communication and just diving really deep into like things like consciousness and conscious agreements and how to bring that same intention, intentionality and architect mindset into like into my friendships, into these day-to-day interactions, not just in how, you know, into where I go and how I live my life, but also into one of, I think the most meaningful aspects of human experience is connection with other humans. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's been beautiful to see the evolution of that for you over the past you know, few years that I've known you and seeing your evolution in and out of certain romantic partnerships to being more embedded in certain, you know, the community and different friend groups. And uh, yeah, I've seen that desire of yours, that seed start to sprout. And it's been really cool to see you um, really struggle with certain things and then come through on the other side and have a breakthrough and a new level of experiencing connection and uh, nonviolent communication and these conscious agreements that you're speaking to and that you're diving into now. So yeah, that's that's been beautiful. Before we dive into that a little bit more, has there been a moment where you're, um, you've really experienced the other side of it where like you haven't felt like there's been conscious communication in a dynamic of a relationship or anything that's made you or been the impetus to you wanting to 
learn about conscious agreements and, and go down this and then we can go down it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, two, two experiences that I had really shaped my, I guess, interest in this uh, capacity. One was, yeah, I was in a long-term partnership with an amazing, amazing human. And as we got, you know, towards the end of that, uh, of that partnership together, I just got so curious about like, why isn't this working or why didn't this work? Yeah. Um, because there was so much love there and so much, um, so many things that, the, so many boxes that were checked off. And, um, when we were discussing like, do we stay together? Do we not, you know, you're in that liminal phase with someone, uh, we did something similar where we said, okay, what are, what are our agreements with each other, conscious or unconscious? What are, um, what are our non-negotiables? And this is after I dated someone for four years, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd think that after four years you would have maybe like done this, mm -hmm. but, um, but it just showed me like how much we can live with someone, live in the space, space with someone and still not really at the core understand like what it is that they're looking for. So, or just that people change, yeah. you know, and I think that experience of finally talking about some of those really, really deep truths and really deep desires, uh, was like, whoa, I really, really wish we had done this sooner, you know? Um, because I think one of the fastest ways to growth or to intimacy is through truth and, that's truth with both yourself and with the people around you. Mm -hmm. And that means having like those hard, really self-aware conversations. And so, yeah, living through that experience, feeling the sense of disconnection and deep loneliness um, within partnership uh, was one of them. And then the other one was, and I think we've actually spoken about this, I have a lot of anxiousness and self-consciousness, even in friendships. And it's something that I've worked on, this sense of worthiness that people actually want to be friends with me or want to spend time with me, that I'm not an imposition. But it's been a really hard pattern for me to break. And the, the more I respect someone, often the more I get nervous that they don't actually want me around or that, uh, you know, that they're there's something that they're not telling me and it creates this, yeah, this kind of like wall between us, unfortunately. And that was one thing that I really wanted to break because I've actually, you know, lost friendships with people that I had so much, just so much love and respect for because we couldn't communicate and we didn't quite understand each other. And one of the biggest things from that was my own, you know, my own anxiousness and my own inability to be myself and super honest with that person. Mm. Um, so that was m my own pain point became the, you know, I was like, how do I alchemize this? And I, I, I wanted to take that pain point and be able to see the lesson in it. Um, and now it's been funny being on the other side of it because I've gotten so curious about communication and conscious partnership and conscious relating that, people are coming to me now to ask me about, you know, advice and different mm -hmm. things like that. So, um, it's funny to like yeah. be on the other side of that and see that switch. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a trip to, you know, we've had conversations about this in the past and whenever you've maybe been struggling through moments of this and it's always initially kind of almost baffling because I'm like, you're such an incredible human being. You're so brilliant and all these things. And, but Oftentimes, and for the listeners, it's like we all have our own projections of how we think people perceive us. And a lot of times the barrier to intimacy is just not expressing how we authentically experience another person. And it's yeah. like that open communication. Often those times we what we think someone is going to judge us or push us away for will actually make them want to embrace us more because we're expressing honestly our, our truth inside. And it's important to like get clarity on what that is first so you can even communicate it. But it's um yeah, it's it's just a really powerful switch to be able to to claim your truth, say whatever is your experience, however vulnerable it is. And oftentimes people will that will create a new level of intimacy in 
romantic or a non-romantic relationship and friendship. Yeah. The most powerful one has actually been in friendship with me where I did this exercise, this like conscious agreement exercise with a friend who I had had a pretty big disconnection with. And we realized the root of the disconnection was that we actually both wanted to be better friends (laughs) and how ironic, you know, um, that we felt the other person maybe didn't want that, that level of of depth with, with us. Mm -hmm. And so I did this agreement with her and like you're saying, once you, once I expressed all these things that I was so nervous about, I expressed the things, the parts of me that I felt like were too much or that might be annoying or might be, um, you know, just petty or whatever it is, those parts of myself that I was so self-conscious about. And I said, Hey, this is a part of me that I'm worried about. And this is a part of me that I'm worried you're not going to like, or that we might have to go through. The deeply transformational part of going through this process with her was learning that those were the parts of myself that she actually resonated with the most. And as I've had this experience with more people, that has been the common thread. It's like the more that I can show up and show those parts of myself that I think are messy or are too much or are maybe something that someone's not going to like about me, those are often the things that are the most connective. And those are the things that people really appreciate about me. And those are the parts that they go, hey, that fits the puzzle of how I show up in the world too. And I, I see that in you and I don't mind that about you. And, um, so it's been a lesson in just bringing more of myself to the world and how that, that actually creates a more magnetism to the people that you want to be spending time around. And it creates this sense of ease in myself Mm. because I'm being so honest about who I am, that I'm not putting up these walls or shutting off these parts of myself that I I perceive as being less than or better than or whatever. Um, And it just makes life more fun. Mm. Absolutely. I think it's so, it's so valuable. And like that, that conscious check-in with another individual just allows so much more depth to be created within the connection. And oftentimes what we fear another person is maybe judging us for is what we judge in ourselves and what we're afraid that somebody isn't going to accept us for is what we don't accept within ourselves. And so just to speak into it, it's funny to, to dissolve the illusory nature of our perceptions of how others think about us. Think about us and just check in with them and just ask them and actually find out. It's so funny how scary it is to ask. Yeah. And that's the thing that I've been finding. <laughs> and I was like, this is so, this is so funny um, to be having a lot of these conversations at sort of the newer stages of friendship or even having them, you know, with people I've known for a long time. But it's a little bit scary to just like fully say these things about yourself. And like you said, that they're to have such a clear reflection. Um, it's been a really clear reflection for me of those parts of myself that I don't fully love or fully accept, um, or that I judge a little bit. And one thing I've been working on is not being so judgmental both towards myself and others and realizing like, Oh, this is just, this just is, this just is. And I can, I can learn from this and there's beauty in the way that everyone shows up in the world and that my way isn't necessarily like the right way. Yeah. Um, and it's often hard, especially like on, on social media, there's so many opinions and so many people kind of, there's this really big sense of like right and wrong and black and white. And this is like the way you should be or shouldn't be. Um, And I've just been really trying to cultivate a lot of like empathy and compassion for my own experience and and other people's experience. And like it's allowed me to take maybe what you'd call negative feedback of people that don't agree with something I say or something I do and just like listen from a place of of empathy and, and be like, okay, is this, does this feel true to my experience? Is this like what my, what I was trying to say? Um, and understand what was like, what is useful feedback and what is maybe, 
um, just unnecessary, unnecessary or, or part of their experience. Yeah. And it's brought a lot of peace into mm. my life. Mm. Powerful. It's so good. And, and it takes relationships take time and energy to maintain and to foster and to grow just like anything, our relationship with anything, with our yeah. health, with our body, with our mindset, with people, it takes time and energy to, to foster and grow those connections. And it's important to have the continuous check-in. It's not just a one-time thing. There's that saying that no man steps into the same river for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. And it's because the nature of life is constantly evolving and changing. And if you don't have that uh, that communication where you're consciously expressing how you feel and what your yeses are and what your noes are and what your desires are, then you're going to be left up to what you think the expectations of another person are in your own. And it's not going to allow for depth and connection. And so it's been really cool to see those moments of authentic, real, deep connection where you're expressing who you fully are. And there were many moments of that at Burning Man when <laughs> we uh, we got to spend more time together at Burning Man than I was even thinking, which was, st- I was stoked. I know, so same, <laughs> same. Like in the freaking craziest storms, we're just sitting in your RV, like having deep life chats. Yeah, yeah. yeah or so like good. Sam, like l- Sam and I literally like went out in the middle uh, middle of the night, just go run to the bathroom and we run into you on the way back. Yes. It's like those synchronistic moments are so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so this is great. I'm loving this whole talk. I think um, just to kind of close this out, yeah. what do you feel like have been a couple of questions that you have asked or prompts for people that want to have these conscious agreements with a friend? Like where do you begin or how do you initiate that? Mm. Or how have you... How have you done that? Yeah, I actually have a whole PDF on my phone because so many people have been asking me for it, like friends. So now I share it out and nice. it's it's super fun. But I think the basis of it, um, the basis of these conscious agreements is getting really clear, like first in yourself. So it's a self-practice, first of all. Step one would be understanding what is it that I'm seeking out of this friendship, this partnership, this business relationship, mm-hmm. whatever it is. Um, that is really, yeah, specific to this container. Yeah. And on the flip side of that, what is it that I have the capacity to offer? Um, because, for example, for me to get really granular, I know that I'm someone who doesn't have a ton of time. And that creates resistance for me in in forming new friendships because I feel like I won't be able to show up for them in yeah. the way that like – hey, part of being friends with me means like I travel a lot. I'm probably not going to be there for your birthday. I'm not going to be there for these specific things. I probably won't even be able to check in every day, you know, and for sure. um, and just being really clear and like I, I can show up in this way. So it's both like a sense of getting clear in what you can offer and what it is that you would like to receive. Um, so it's it's pretty simple. It, it starts yeah. really with that. Um, and then I have both people uh, can come together and compare your your list there of like, hey, this is something I desire in you. Does that bring excitement for you? Does that sound like something that, you know, you want to have mm-hmm. as part of kind of like our contract of our container yeah. that we're creating here? Um, and the thing about these is every single conscious agreement is so different. And I think that's the, the, the beauty and the basis of what attracts me to these things is that you're, you're deciding it's just you and the one other person you're deciding what that friendship looks like. You're deciding what is it that we're bringing into each other's lives. And, um, you compare lists, hopefully, you know, there's alignment with those lists or you're understanding that, Hey, there's actually some really big points of, of difference here and resistance. And do those things feel like there are bridging points or are they kind of not, um, and then I'm, I love ceremony around things. So I love to write out the whole contract in my journal and kind of like have that as, as, you know, like a snapshot of, of what it is that we're creating together. Mm-hmm. And it's been really powerful to do this with different people and to even be able to like reference the contract when certain sticky points come up, um, and crunchy points that, that happen within every, you know, close friendship. Uh, and for me, it just creates this immense sense of safety of like, you know, as someone who has a lot of anxiousness around friendships, it creates that sense of like, 
we've both committed to be here and we really, really want to be here. Yeah. And like, I, I see you and I know you see me and like, there isn't this sense of, I need to only show you the easy parts or the good parts of myself. Mm. Yeah. Powerful. I love that. I love the way you broke that down and just creating like an intentional container where you can sit down and say, Hey, this is what we're doing. Let's dive into this. Let's create our own desires. And also I love how you spoke to going into it, asking what can I give in this relationship? A lot of people, I feel like the relationships are, are very transactional and they see what, what can I get? But when you go into relationship or friendship or whatever, asking what can I give? That is just much more fertile soil for that relationship to blossom and to be nourishing for each other. And those are my best friendships when we can come together and we can um, give to each other in that way. And it doesn't have to look like any one certain way of giving, um, but people give in different ways. And sometimes it's they have more time freedom. Sometimes maybe somebody has, um, they, they're more, they love to gift and show love in that way, or they love to support and an act of service or mm -hmm. something like that. And it's just important to get clear on what are the ways you show love? What are the ways you receive love? Um, what are the, your ideas for how you want to commit time in this, in this relationship, in this friendship? And then it's like, um, yeah, those friendships can just have so much more spaciousness and freedom when those expectations are settled and you can just allow it to be what it, what it can be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had this weird epiphany the other day when I was, I was, I lose pens a lot and I was, <laughs> I was r racing around in the morning trying to, trying to find my pen. And I'm like, where the heck is it? And I finally find it. And I'm like trying to write. It's not writing. It's not writing. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is so frustrating. And, and I just felt that frustration building and building. And then I, I took a second and I was like, okay, wait, uncapped the pen. I looked and there's no, like, there's no ink inside the pen. And I'm like, of course. And it just was like this ding of like, oh, sometimes people are like pens, but we can't see the insides of people. We can't see what their capacity is to give or what their desire is to give. Mm -hmm. And like, maybe if we could see, you know, bring, bring light to what's on the inside, to the outside, to our shared experience, then we would know that maybe we're just asking not the wrong thing, but we're asking it of the wrong person mm. and that there is no wrong desire. There's no, you know, there's nothing wrong with you as a person for desiring something. It's just, how does that, how does that, um, meet with what someone else has the actual capacity to give? Do they have ink in their system mm. to be able to write with you in that way? Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I love that analogy of just, going into a relationship to really see is your cup full before going into this or some relationships, maybe that's where you fill your cup up. Some relationships, maybe it's just where your cups are full and you like being in the presence of each other and just like getting clear on what that is and what somebody's constitution is. How is their cup? Are you guys charging each other or are you guys draining each other? Are you filling each other's cups up or not? And it's really important to get clear on that. So that's beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Amazing. That was a great, I, I love talking about human connection and relationships and friendships is just such a big part of our human experience and being able to have clear communication, which is how we connect with other people. And it doesn't have to just be verbal. There's a lot of ways to communicate with your body, with um, the ways that you show up and just your presence. And if you're not able to be with somebody you know, every day or even every week or every month, the time that you are with each other to like fully be present mm -hmm. and to fully give yourself in that moment, um, I think is really powerful. Last thing before we kind of move on, we've been mm -hmm. talking about this for a little bit. <laughs> what are a, a couple things that you really cherish the most in your friendships? Are there a couple qualities or characteristics of someone's character that you've really come to love the most? Mm -hmm. Fill you up. Uh, there's so many things, yeah. but, and, and I feel so blessed with the friendships I have now. Um, what I seek in others in this moment is number one, honesty. Um, again, to assuage that sense of safety in me, I want to know that someone will speak their truth to me. Um, I think I read this thing the other day is like, uh, our ability to be honest with those around us is actually such a gift mm -hmm. because then they're not worried about reading between the lines. They're not worried about that. They're asking too much because they have full trust in you to be able to state a boundary. If something's not feeling good for you, if something, if you're not able to do something. And so it frees us to be able to ask for what we desire from each other, mm -hmm. knowing that each person has complete sovereignty to 
say yes or say no. And that is like so sacred to me to Mm. know that a person will have that level of integrity with what they're feeling inside. Because I think that's where a lot of my nervousness comes from is like, oh, am I asking too much of this person? And they're going to do something for me and secretly resent me or, the, you know, they yeah. don't really want to or something. Uh, so that's the first thing is on it, like that level of honesty. Uh, and then I think the second one is their dedication to play and enthusiasm in life. I don't really care what you're enthusiastic about. I just care that you are enthusiastic. Yeah, I love it. And there is something about that energy that is so magnetic to me. And I think when you're fully embodied in your play, it's like, it's so fun to watch. It's so fun to be around. Yeah. It's it's like this invitation into, um, into yeah, just to be a part of that experience. Mm-hmm. And so like acro for me has been this big invitation into play and I'm not the best acrobat. I'm far, far, far from it, but I'm so freaking enthusiastic about (laughs) it that people are always like, I want to try this because of you, because it seems really fun. And, um, I think play becomes this really great source of inspiration when you can, it's, it's not about like, this thing being so perfect or so polished or so whatever it is, yeah. it's just like, are you in flow? Are you having the most fun doing it and cultivating more of that energy of play? Yeah. I love it. So powerful. And I'm so grateful for the community of friends that we have that are all such kiddos and like to show up and play as kids. Um, those are, those are the best where we can like, and I really love the people that are able to hold the balance, you know, like that are like, very vision focused and love creating epic things in the world, but um, also just really love to play and be kids and act like complete idiots around each other. (laughs) I guess that's like, I'm so attracted to paradoxes or contradictions Mm. or people that don't fit in to certain boxes because I don't feel like I fit into a certain box. Like, yeah, I like, so fucking driven sometimes and I like want to show up in the world and I want to be purposeful and I want to like build and create and I want to have impact and then there's this part of me that's like I want to roll around the floor like a like a gerbil and be really silly and spin around on people's feet and um and just you know watch every sunset and be so stoked on the same thing over and over and over um and yeah having that you know, duality, like one of my intentions, this, the beginning of this year was like, I want to be, you know, super grounded earth goddess, babe. I also want to be like a boss bitch. (laughs) I want to be like, you know, I, I I have these two tattoos actually. So I have, you know, a sun here and I just recently got this, this moon and stars. And for me, it's a reminder of that duality, both in life and in self of, I want to play in my light and I also want to play in my shadows yeah. and I, w- I love people who can, like you said, just go back and forth and, and be grounded, show up so hard in the world and also be so silly and so light. Mm. So good. Beautiful. I love it. I'm on the same boat. That's why we get along. Yeah. I'm excited to do our conscious agreements and see what that I is. I know. <gasps> Will you do? tell me what one of ours would be? What would do you it? have one? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess there would be lots of things. I think there's so there's so many. I think I really what I really love about our community and our connection, I think in particular, is the fact that there is the polarity of like not fitting in a box, but mm. because we're able to play in so many different realms of business and playing at a big scale with what we want to create. Uh, but also just like really val- value the the nourishing, yummy human connection and community um, and things that we do. I would just love to see, explore c- in, in conversation how we can really be of support mm-hmm. each other. I would wanted to see how could I support you really and see which ways I could show this up. This is so funny. This is so funny. And this is why I love doing these. So the, the thing that I was thinking in my body before you said that was – one of the things I'm worried about is that I ask you for support too often and Mm. that I ask you questions too often about podcasting, about business things, about what you think about a certain aspect Mm. of my life and that I look to you for guidance. Um, And so that's so funny that you're on the other side of going, 
I would love to know how we can support each other. And I'm like, I'm worried he doesn't want to support me in this way. Aww. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Aww. There we go. So you get live in action. I know. It's so beautiful. It's great. No, it fills me up to have those conversations and see how I can be of support. There's like, yeah, there's like a usefulness that I feel about my existence when I'm showing up and like being able to, whether it's provide advice, guidance, or just a pure reflection of take it for what it is. Um, like that fills me up. That's so, yeah. See, so this is why I love this. And it, it's exactly that because I've always felt like I've come to you as, yeah, a sense of like a guide for me, for advice. You've been there, th- you know, through multiple breakups and different things. And I've leaned on you a lot for support in that. And then just this morning or yesterday, I was like, is this a good microphone? Would this be good for <laughs> podcasting? You know, um, and so to know that that in some ways fills you with this sense of usefulness is like, that is so beautiful, you yeah. know, um, because I often hold myself back from mm. asking um, in trying not to be too much for yeah. people. I love that. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Powerful. We have to do ours. We yeah, will. We'll do ours Absolutely. after we, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, cool. There's, um, yeah, there's a handful of questions I wrote towards the end for like a kind of, um, yeah, just like oh my a gosh. Fa- rapid fire, rapid <gasps> fire thing. So bad at rapid fire. Let's do it. Let's it's do okay. it. It's okay. You can, there's going to be a few that if you want to elaborate, let's elaborate and we can go down for sure. But I'm going to try, I'm going <laughs> to try, I'm going to try to be rapid fire. Okay. What book has impacted your life the most and why? Ooh, dang it. This is such a good one. Um, most recent book, biggest impact untamed by Glennon Doyle Melton. I read that after my last breakup and it is just, it will light you on fire and like make you feel invincible Mm. um especially as a woman Mm. she just she has this incredible way of writing that i i'm blown away by and one of the passages i think says like um i like i can feel i can feel everything i can feel all the pain and i can survive it and i can transmute it and um that she just has this way of taking the messiness of the human experience and the things that feel like they're going to break us and so clearly illuminating how those are the moments that are hidden gifts that like bring out this side of you and sharpen you in this way that you will not walk out the same person. Mm. And yeah, I was really, really inspired by that, by that book. Amazing. It's beautiful. Has there been one change in behavior most that you've done since reading that book? Or has it just been the energy that I guess you kind of carry yourself with differently? I think it's an energy, but also a desire. Like after I read that book, I felt, I was like, I want to take up more space in the world. And I also, I mean, I've always been someone who loved honesty and vulnerability, but I just really embraced that wholeheartedly of Mm sharing that side of myself, both online and in person, uh, like, yeah, just understanding how all these things that are really hard and gritty. Um, it just gave like, it gave me the sense of peace in, in the way that she writes how like the human experience is supposed to be messy it's supposed to be hard you're supposed to feel all these things and it's not because you're doing it wrong it's because you're a human Mm -hmm. and that was like oh yeah I'm not I'm not doing this wrong because I (laughs) feel so much and I'm someone that like just I feel things all the time um and how to let those feelings become like a knowing and a gift um and something that I am not afraid to to dive into the depths of. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So interesting. I, I love that. I definitely resonate almost in a different sense where there's been a, a lot of my own personal journey where there's been this like energy of transcending the human experience. And it's like, <laughs> at, you know, over the past few years, like coming back into the, my body of like, what if you just had a full human experience? Like you came here to experience the contrast of all of you and all of the emotions that you carry and all the things. And not to meditate your way out of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I think earlier in my journey was more of that like hyper vigilance and it's evolved the thing into more of like a just genuine, you know, desire for that and seeking. Okay, beautiful. Great. Next. Okay. <laughs> Keeping it short. How has uh, an apparent failure in your past set you up for success later? 
an apparent failure for me was I have always wanted to be married and I am 33 Mm. and I have felt an immense sense of failure around finding a partner and finding that other half of Mm. me Um, to the point that I finally sort of let go of that dream for myself. Mm. Um, And because I just, it seemed like it wasn't happening. It wasn't happening. It wasn't happening. And um, yeah, in finally letting go of that and in just becoming so curious about myself and who I am as a person and learning to deeply, deeply like love who I am, I actually ended up attracting a partner and from a space not of need or not of um, unworthiness, but from a space of super, super wholeness. And I took all of those lessons of all of those failures in relationships and why they didn't work and was able to really clearly slot those lessons into this one. And I feel really blessed in the, in the partnership that I'm in now, um, to have it be the best thing I've ever experienced, Mm -hmm. to be the deepest sense of love I've ever experienced. And I would, I just, yeah, I, I've always felt like such a failure. And now I feel like every single one of those lessons were necessary lessons for me to learn. Mm. Oh, amazing. So good. I think that's, I mean, I have so much compassion for women, especially that feel like there's this pressure, not only on the biological clock, but also the societal conditioning saying you need to be married and have a kid by your 30. Otherwise you're a failure. And it's like it's so much pressure. And we live in an era now where you can take your time with you can take your time and, and really at least internally release some of that pressure that you have for yourself. It's different for a man than it is for a woman, no yeah. doubt. Um, but that's beautiful. And I think that's such a powerful take home for the listeners is just understanding magnetism and polarity when you sometimes what you pursue eludes you in the fact that you re- when you really feel this internal desire and need for something it is almost like a magnet that'll push away. But when you release your need and you kind of find that sense of okayness and home within yourself, then you ironically become a match to that feeling because the universe doesn't speak in English, it speaks in vibration. And so what vibration are you emitting? If you're emitting, I need this, I need this, I need this, it's not going to be a match to it. You're saying, I don't have it. Yeah. But I'm, I, I was saying, choose me, choose me, choose me. Mm. And I I was not in a space of choosing myself. Yeah. So yeah, like you said, it's it's that vibrational match and coming into like full integrity with what is that vibration that yeah. I'm both putting out and thus able to receive. Absolutely. So it's like getting clear on what is, we don't want the things we want. We want the things that we want the feelings we think the things will give us. Yes. Right. So it's like, what feeling does a potential partnership or family, what does that give me? Um, and for everybody that's going to be different, maybe it's a sense of safety, of joy, of peace. And it's like, okay, if you can actually embody those feelings, then you'll become a, a vibrational match like we spoke to for potentially that to come in. Life works in mysterious ways. You never know what, which way it's going to unfold. Sometimes it'll then make you become a match to that partner or another way in which it could expe- exceed your expectations or dream, what you know, of your own dreams of what you could ever while you know, dream of your wildest imagination. It's like life will surprise you in, in much more beautiful ways than what we think we want. Yeah. So that's awesome. I love that. We're, we're failing at this rapid fire, I will say. <laughs> <laughs> this is like medium speed medium. fire. <laughs> okay, what is the most worthwhile investment you've made in? In yourself or in life? It could be time, money, or energy. Ooh. Most worthwhile investment I've made. Mm. Can you tell that I'm a person that thinks a lot? I I think the most worthwhile investment I've made is just like the energy I put into other people. Mm. Um, And that's always felt really natural. But I see how every person that I've met has exponentially contributed back into my life with so many forms of learning, whether that comes as, you know, I've learned highlighting, I've learned free diving, I've learned acro from, from people that have been huge teachers for me, uh, in the physical realm, but also in, in just like the spiritual realm and the mental realm of creating a better life for myself, uh, they always say like human capital, human capital is like the most Mm -hmm. important capital. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And those relationships that I've been able to cultivate, I think, have been the thing that have brought the most beauty into my life Mm. and the most teachers and the most lessons. Mm. Beautiful. That's amazing. I love that. Okay. Basically everything cool about me, I've learned from someone else is what I'm saying. (laughs) So uh, yeah, it's It's, just, it's true though. Yeah. Everyone gives into like, I feel like I've been poured into at a level that I never um, could have imagined. Mm, I love it. Powerful. Okay. What in the last few years, what has been one new behavior, belief, or habit that has most improved your life? Mm. Behavior. Mm. Drinking more water. <laughs> <laughs> Could be simple. The, um, one behavior. Mm. Not checking my phone the first thing in the morning mm. has been a big one for me. I used to wake up and have the phone right there and just right into it. Um, So sleeping with my phone in another room, sleeping with an airplane mode, whatever it is, uh, just to have that spaciousness in the morning to not immediately tune into the, what people want from me, what the world is trying to tell me, what news is happening. Just that little bit of pause in my morning. I feel like that's my most creative time. I know some people say they create at night. I am like, 100% 100% on fire in the mornings. So I do all my best writing in that time before I interact with anyone. That's where I feel the most inspired. That's when I create probably 99% of my video ideas, my business ideas. Mm. Um, so yeah, taking that space in the mornings to tune inwards instead of outwards, huge life hack. Mm, amazing. I did that. Second that for sure. Amazing. Um, okay. What's the biggest tip of advice that you have for a young creative that's starting out and wants to turn their passions into their lifestyle, into their career? Mm. Biggest tip that I have for young creatives would be to find how many points of intersectionality you have within yourself that are really unique. Mm. So like, what is it that is so specific, so specific to you? Um, cause there's, bazillion content creators out there now. Um, and I think there's space for all of us as long as all of us are entirely ourselves. Mm. And one thing that, uh, I listen to a lot of Naval or these different Mm. marketing podcasts and he, he says, um, you know, keep, keep redefining who you are and what you do until you're the best at it in the world. Mm. And that's just, yeah, narrowing that kind of like, focus but to me it's not even just a narrowing it's um it's those really neat intersection points because i think intersection points are where we create innovation yeah. within ourselves within the world and you know if i only traveled or if i only did mindfulness there's like kind of a singular dimensionality to that yeah. um but if you're someone who it's like oh it's she she has all these cross sections of like, yeah. Oh, she's someone who traveled, but also shares about mindfulness yeah. and is, um, you know, deeply passionate about the ocean, but also does acrobatics. Um, you just become a more and more unique individual. And I think we crave to see people in their uniqueness and in their individuality. Yeah. Um, that's definitely something that I would pass on to, to younger creators. Mm. Just, just lean into that, lean into, and, and, embrace that side of yourself. Like I know one young content creator who came to me and he's like, ah, like I'm colorblind. And that's just like this huge barrier for me. Um, but he has like beautiful content, beautiful photos. He's never spoken about the fact that he's colorblind. I was like, to me, that's so interesting about you. Like that could be a whole story around that you're navigating this creative space, you know, through this lens of actually not seeing most of the colors and stuff. And it had never occurred to him to lean into that mm. challenge or lean into that side of himself. He just saw it as an, a negative really. So yeah. there's so much power in leaning into and embracing what makes us, us and all the shadow and all the light. So that's, uh, that's so powerful. Love it. <clears throat> okay. When you feel overwhelmed, what do you do to support yourself? Best thing for me when I feel overwhelmed is movement um, or 
if I'm able to, it depends on the source of the overwhelm, but movement is the best for me for moving that, like that anxiousness, that energy, that stagnancy. Um, and it's kind of like that fire that purifies me. Mm. And, or there's having the consciousness around, okay, I'm in a situation that isn't good for me. Like I'm really, um, sensitive to like sound and to certain types of lighting. So sometimes, you know, my friends will go into somewhere to get a coffee and it's like, they're playing really loud music or whatever. And I'll just be like, Hey, I'm just gonna, I'm going to wait outside like mm-hmm. in the sunshine or whatever. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, when I'm, when I'm feeling overwhelmed though, definitely like movement for me is, is the key. Amazing. And yeah. breathing. Breath and movement. Change your life. Change your life. People. Change your life. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Okay. What's one moment or event in your life where you learn the most about yourself? Mm. I learned the most about myself in in acro, actually. Oh wow. And specifically, in my in my acro teacher training or different immersions that I've done, um, because it 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 taught me how to see parts of myself and not judge them. And for example, like every person I think is born with inherent strengths and inherent weaknesses. Um, and when I'm in my training, you very clearly see like, what are my imbalances in my body? What am I naturally gifted at? What am I naturally not gifted at? And I realized how much of my tendency is to lean into those things that like the skills that I am good at. And I would get so frustrated or so down on myself with these, like, you know, certain skills. I don't have a perfect handstand line because, you know, my back is like this and I have scoliosis and my things are like this. Um, And there used to be a lot of judgment for me around what I can and cannot do or what I'm naturally gifted at. Uh, And a big shift for me came from meeting another woman in my training who was kind of like my mirror. She was naturally good at the things I wasn't. She had a perfect handstand line, was super, Mm -hmm. super straight. Um, But she couldn't do a lot of the the rolling, more dynamic skills that I could do. And um, in that moment, I just was like, it's it's so clear how all of us have these, these beauty and this lightness and weaknesses and natural gifts and things that we aren't gifted at. And um, to release my judgment for, for myself around those things um, was huge because there is always going to be someone on the other side who would love to be good at what you're good at or what comes naturally to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and just to to hold, hold space for all of it. So I love it. Yeah. Beautiful. So good. Okay. What, how, how do you wish most to inspire others in the world? Mm. I see it as my mission right now to be able to inspire people through giving them more, like introducing them and inspiring them to use the tools that I've been finding around mindfulness, around meditation, around play and movement, and to really just invite people into all of these spaces that I've found that are like so like useful and nourishing to me for human connection, for just leveling up in life. Um, but I've realized my way of, of inspiring isn't like, it isn't talking to people and saying, Hey, you should really do this thing. It's just embodying that thing to like a degree that it feels like something that they want to do, that they're inspired to try. And that to me is I guess my, I believe all of us, like the way we walk through the world can be a form of art and a form of inspiration and a form of, um, magnetic embodiment. And so just honestly trying to be like my best self. And I have this mantra now of like nothing less than fully alive. Mm. And that is the North star to which I am guiding myself because that is what I want for myself. That is what I want for my sister, my family, my community, my friends for the whole world is a life that feels fully, fully alive. Mm, Love that. So good. That's so beautiful. This, uh, 
I mean, I knew we were gonna have a good podcast, but I feel like this one has been like really, really good, juicy. There's been so many parts throughout this I've been really, really. Loving. Oh it's my gosh, great. I'm. I always just feel like I'm. I'm so bad at them. <laughs> <laughs> You're crushing it. You're doing great. So, is there anything else that we have as we're wrapping up? Is there anything else that you want to speak to that we haven't spoke to yet? Mm. We touched on a lot. We touched on a lot. We we did touch on a lot. Um, no, I mean, I would love. Oh, I would love to tell people that my new journal yeah. is coming out. Yeah. Um, I designed a journal for, you know, people tr- just starting to get into the habit who want a little bit more guidance around the journaling practice um, and, you know, seeking their own truth. So I have a new version of that coming out uh, just in this next week. It'll probably be out by the time mm. the podcast comes yeah. out. Um, it's called Notes to Self. Right? It's actually called Notes to Mindfulness now mm-hmm. because we had to do a little a little nice. cheeky name change for some <laughs> copyright things. <Got> but <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's new and it's ego friendly. It's been the biggest passion project of of my life, and it's been the way that I feel the most um, purposeful in what I've brought into the mm. world. Um, so yeah, if people want to check that out, that's super cool. But that's yeah, I think that's beautiful. I I do want you to also just touch on briefly because I feel like you do have a very eco mindful driven ethos in which you carry yourself throughout the world. Um, is there anything that you want to touch on that just as an individual living your life when you have so much, I mean, you're traveling so much, you're creating so many things yet you're very, you know, you're staying true and you're doing your best to live eco and, and mindfully in your business creations, whether it's a journal or you're working with brands, it's, it's been really cool to see you stick to your integrity of what you uh, think is going to actually be helpful for the planet. Yeah. I mean, I, I consider myself someone who's uh, imperfectly eco-conscious um, because I think we unfortunately live in a system right now that doesn't make it the easiest to, um, to make some of these decisions, you know? So, um, yeah, the, the products that I make, I try to do, you know, plastic free or using hundred percent recycled materials. That's been like a through line for me, um, of just wanting to create things that are meaningful and long lasting and, you know, I'm just trying to have a net positive. I know that everything I do, I travel, I fly, like, that is definitely not something that is good for the planet. You know, I, I have my e-bike and things like I try to offset in, in different ways, but it's being a human in this world, in this moment means that we are having an impact. Um, and how, how can I, uh, in, input as many like positive behaviors and positive decisions and, uh, vote you know, with that consciousness towards a better planet and a better future. So, um, yeah, I try to implement that in every way and make it really fun. Like I, I want to make mental health and I want to make being eco-conscious like super fun and super sexy Yeah, because I think that's the only way that we're all going to create like change. Like I, I love the saying, the, um, the artist's job is to make the revolution irresistible. Yeah. And that's what I want to do for, yeah, for mental health, for things like journaling and uh, things like being more eco-conscious because it can and should be really fun and really fulfilling. And I, yeah, I just want to create a world where people aren't obligated or they're not feeling, they're not doing things out of obligation. They're doing out of things of excitement and joy yeah. because that is the only way that this be like these behaviors yeah. will stick and be sustainable. Mm. So powerful. I love that. I'm on the same boat. It's just like we, we, if you want to actually affect real change, you need to have that embodiment within yourself. And then the vibrancy of how you live your life and how you, the inspiration that you are will actually draw people into living that lifestyle and be more eco-conscious and, eco-friendly and and all the things but when we try to proselytize people into our way of behaving and say you need to do this otherwise you're a bad person um, which has been a predominant narrative in the way that we try to get people to change their behavior through religion and through various different means Mm -hmm. Um, it's just a different way and it's it's the only way that i feel like actually affects true lasting change is to inspire people to want to make the changes for themselves, not because they feel like they need to. So I think you're crushing it. You're doing a great job at it. You're making all those things, mindfulness, being eco-friendly, 
super dope, super, super sexy and very attractive for the mainstream. And I can't wait to continue to see you and witness you on your journey of how you inspire the planet because you're so young. I'm so inspired by how you're showing up and what you're doing on the planet. And just to see where you're going to continue to evolve down is, is very exciting. So I'm here watching popcorn and here to support you <laughs> along the way. <laughs> I love it. I've enjoyed this conversation immensely. You're always someone who I think brings out like the best in all the people around you because you have so much presence and such a way of creating like just such a dope safe environment for people to be themselves um so this has been super super fun mm. i also love witnessing you and i can't wait for us to do our our conscious agreement yes. it's gonna be so much fun stoked on it thank you so much Yay! i appreciate it all right. I love this. So good. Thank you, everybody who's been tuning in to this episode of the Know Thyself podcast, where every single week I get the pleasure of doing this. I love it. It fills me up as much as I hope it is for you. If you've been enjoying this part, this episode in particular, and you want to find out more of Chelsea, all of the links will be down in the description for her new journal, for her social media. If you haven't already seen her stuff, it's mind blowing. She's a real life mermaid fairy human that is so magical and it's really beautiful to see. The, the films that she's made, free diving and doing acro yoga and the most beautiful exotic locations on the planet, all with this beautiful message and inspiring, um, inspiring ethos to live mindfully. And so Chelsea, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. If you've been enjoying this episode, my call to action is please subscribe, put a lot of energy, time and resources into these and hitting that button helps us reach more people. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful journey and be well.